Stan Gibalisco here uh, with a little explanation of a procedure that I follow when I need to use my emergency backup generator with my furnace electronics. A lot of people who have forced air furnaces will forget that the fan for that furnace as well as the little glow plug that most of them have nowadays along with the electronics will not function if the power fails. So you can't just rely on your gas furnace to keep running without power and heat your house if it's a forced air type of system. So you'll need a backup generator, but if you use a backup generator, you need to be very careful. And In my book, Making Everyday Electronics Work, I explain how I do this it is in the chapter on alternative electricity chapter 4 in this book making everyday electronics work available from McGraw Hill published in the summer of 2013 written by yours truly starting on page 92 I describe a the generator that I actually use it's it's a Honda 2000 I EU 2000 I now 2000 I guess means volt amperes it will supply about 1.3 or 1.4 kilowatts of utility AC electronics uh, or AC electricity for electronic devices and here's where those little outlets are right there those there are two outlets each one provides uh, 120 volts according to the specifications that I can read off of here maybe you can't read them but but I can see them as I'm doing the video here 120 volts 13.3 amperes now you can do the math and figure out how many watts that would be you can also get <clears throat> 12 volts DC out of it right down here <clears throat> presumably at the same pretty much the same amount of power as the uh, AC. The neat thing about this generator, the Honda EU2000i and others like it, there are other companies that make generators like this. Yamaha in particular makes them. Let me change the color of this a little bit so that you can maybe see it a little bit better. There. Honda EU2000i is sufficient for my needs. All I do is, if there's a power failure, is I run only my computer workstation and the furnace. Well, I certainly want to keep warm most of the year around here in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America. Honda EU2000i, that little i means that it has an inverter in it. What that does, this generator doesn't directly pr provide the AC. It is rectified and filtered into DC first. That's where you get this 12 volts. And then an inverter produces a very good, and this is very important for any kind of a generator, a clean sine wave is important. You need a clean sine wave if you want your generator to work properly. And at these outlets right here, that's precisely what you will get out of this generator. It'll help your furnace electronics run smoothly and it'll allow you to use computers. Um, I've found that if you use a, a cheaper generator without a, an inverter, or that does not produce a clean sine wave, your computers will not properly operate. They'll usually just crash on you, uh, and, but they'll just go nuts. I mean, and other electronic devices that are microprocessor controlled will too. But this is the generator that I use. Now here is the scheme that I have set up in case there is a power failure. Here's the 117 volt utility power right here and that's normally supplying through a circuit breaker 
and an isolation switch that normally supplies the furnace with the electricity that it needs. When I uh, got this furnace installed, they installed an isolation switch for me. Now this has to be a complete isolation switch. That's very important. It has to isolate both the hot and the neutral from the external electrical mains in the event that you open up that switch. Uh, you need to consult with an electrician if you aren't sure about what that is. You need to be very careful that you have this isolation switch in here to use in case you connect a generator to anything past it so that the utility workers out, that are working outside will not be placed in danger and also so that when the uh, power comes back on you do not have a conflict and produce some kind of a chaos situation so that elect uh, that isolation switch is extremely important normally that switch is closed it supplies power to the furnace electronics and here's this capped plug now this is a male plug that they installed here and it has exposed pins you don't want those exposed pins normally exposed where you can touch them because under normal circumstances this will have electricity on it and they, so it will be a live male plug and that's a danger so that you need to have a cap on there and all I did was I just bought an outlet like this one well you know just a a, a utility outlet that you would attach to the end of an extension cord and I just didn't connect it to anything I just bought it and left it free you know it's one of those big heavy duty things and I just place it right over this plug to uh, cover up those pins so that uh, no one gets exposed to that electricity until we want to use it of course and then we have to be very careful then too because uh, we don't uh, although normally then it isn't going to have any electricity on it if the power fails here then there won't be any electricity to this circuit breaker box nevertheless I open up the breaker that goes to the furnace electronics the particular breaker that goes to the furnace electronics I open up that breaker when the power fails before I do anything else I open up that breaker after that I go down to the furnace and open up this isolation switch so that we've got two layers of protection for the external personnel and two layers of protection against conflict in the event the power comes back on unexpectedly which it usually does it goes off unexpectedly and then comes back on surprise you've got power again so you want this isolation switch and the open circuit breaker that offers two layers of protection but I believe that the National Electrical Code requires that you use one of these. Uh, if you don't, your homeowner's insurance policy might be void. You might void the warranty on your furnace and you could expose yourself to not only the legal liability in case anything bad happens to utility workers, but the guilt that you would suffer if anyone was injured as a result of your uh, activities to keep yourself warm so here's the furnace electronics now it's dead to the dead to the world not only has the power failed but there's two open switches in the way but this here's this capped plug but it's dead to the dead to the world too now so you can uncap it and you don't have to worry that you're going to get nailed with a shock in the event that power comes back on unexpectedly because you've got these two layers of protection here and here to protect yourself in case you're touching this plug in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what I have then is a Honda EU2000i generator right here. I go downstairs and I fire up that generator. I put it outside so the exhaust won't blow towards the house. Uh, I try. I made the mistake once of firing up this generator in the woodshed, which is partially enclosed under my 
uh, under my uh, dining room, not totally enclosed, but partially, and enough carbon monoxide accumulated under there to leak into the house and set off my carbon monoxide detector, warning me that that was not a good deal. You got to place this generator so the exhaust goes away from the house and doesn't get, uh, find its way in there and do bad things. Uh, you, you know carbon monoxide is not a particularly healthy thing to have in your breathing air. Now, I have a power strip here, and here's one of the outlets from that. It does not have a transient suppressor, also known as a surge suppressor or surge protector. It should not have one of these because the inverter in this Honda EU2000i, uh, inverters do not like transient suppressors. In my experience, uh, you'll get a lot of trouble if you have a transient suppressor following uh, a, an inverter type generator or an inverter all by itself, say for example in your solar or wind powered standalone system. So no transient suppressor. Here's the power strip. I uncap that plug and I plug it into this power strip. The power strip is normally switched off once I've plugged this pl uh, plug into the outlet, I'm assured that the generator is properly running. Then I switch this power strip on, at which point the furnace comes on. And it will run as long as this generator is going and has gas, and it doesn't really require very much power. Certainly, I have had the experience of a protracted power failure, meaning hours, in the winter. And I ran not only my furnace, but my computer workstation from this generator. I have a similar arrangement, by the way, for my computer workstation, except this isolation switch here is not needed because I literally unplug my computer workstation from the wall outlet before I connect it to the generator. So that totally isolates it. And that's really the best way to go if you can do that, is to literally unplug uh, your the device, whatever it is you want to power up and keep running. It's best if you can literally unplug it from the utility. I mean, it's like unplugging all of those television sets and radios and things like some of these little old ladies used to do b during a thunder shower uh, to protect them from getting fried in the event that lightning struck the power wires or struck near the power wires. Same deal. If you totally isolate everything, uh, then you're completely safe from having any conflict with this. I should mention that if you have an isolation, if you do not have an isolation switch or the proper kind of isolation switch uh, and the and your utility company finds out about it, they're probably not going to like you very much. So anyway, that's what I do. Now, when the power comes back on, I can usually tell because the rest of the lights in the house come on or the rest of the lights in town come on. When that happens, I more or less reverse this process. I switch this power strip off. I unplug this thing and put the cap back on it. Then I turn the isolation switch back on and I turn the circuit breaker for the, for the furnace back on. Then, of course, I go downstairs and power down my Honda EU2000i until the next time that it is needed. And I maintain this generator very carefully. I test it every two weeks for an hour. I make sure I've got fresh premium grade gas for it. I change its oil according to the schedule because I want it to be there for me when there's really a situation here in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory. And I suspect that this coming winter there certainly will be an opportunity of that type because I'm expecting in my bones just call me an old weather fuddy-duddy. An epic winter. An epic winter. One for the history books. 
blizzard after blizzard and when the power goes out and they can't get to the lines to repair them because the snow is five feet deep the wind is blowing 60 miles an hour I'm gonna be mighty glad I took care of that Honda EU 2000i and maintained it and tested it every two weeks making everyday electronics work get this book it's written by me and uh, it just gives you some well as one reviewer so aptly put it a strange amalgam of little tidbits that you may or may not find useful I think you will I hope you will that's why I wrote it Stan Gibalisco signing off from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory United States of America visit me on my website at sciencewriter.net you'll find other videos for this book and other books that I've written you'll find links to books that you can buy from amazon.com written by me and you'll find various other uh, uh, various and sundry other uh, tidbits and a strange amalgam on my website sciencewriter.net until next time so long